Teachers are supposed to be role models, a shining example of who the children should look up to. But the life of a teacher is not often glamorous. Many times it's seen as a burden with the amount of kids that are placed under their watch. To cope with this burden, some inadvertently turn to the bottle, needing alcohol to get through the day and fight their personal demons. These are the teachers with overwhelming personal demons showing up drunk on the first day and how they were eventually arrested. Kimberly Coates Summer break was over. It was the first day of the school term, with all the kids of Perkins Tryon Intermediate School resuming their educational obligation. For kids, this was the most challenging day of the year, forced to forget all the summer escapades and begrudgingly continue school from where they left off. But this only applies to kids. If you are an adult, summer break can go on for as long as you want, if you really put your mind to it. That was the mindset of this middle grade teacher. 53-year-old Kimberly Simmons Oates walked into her third grade classroom with a cup that she claimed was filled with juice. Summer might have been over for her students, but not her. She was determined to get drunk no matter what, and this decision spiraled quickly out of control. On getting to the school premises that morning, a relatively sober Kimberly Coates stumbled into the Perkins Tryon School Superintendent Douglas Ogle at about 8 a.m. This brief interaction they had would serve as a reference point for which all the events would unravel. Before Coates was arrested, school resource officer Shane Dean had been contacted by Superintendent Douglas Ogle at 3.20 p.m. on August 17th to come to the intermediate school regarding her behavior that appeared to have changed in the afternoon from the morning. When the superintendent saw her in the afternoon, he told her, she seemed like you're not the same person I talked to this morning. The officer and school administration further suggested she had been drinking since arriving at school and since class started at 8.25 a.m., the school resource officer also corroborated this information in his sworn affidavit. The school resource officer stated in his affidavit, I noticed Kimberly had red watery eyes and a thick slurred speech. Kimberly had a hard time completing sentences. Mr. Ogle told her that when he talked to her this morning, she acted differently than how she is now, Kimberly said. She took some medication last night for anxiety, but nothing else. Body cam footage of the entire interrogation was made public. She was questioned by an Oklahoma police officer, Sergeant Geeden, as well as the school superintendent, Douglas Ogle. Um, I, did take a, I, I did take some medication last night to, to help me with sleep because I have some anxiety stuff, but that's... that's... I can't think of the name of it right now, but I could look it up when I get home. Now take this in. This is the first statement she gives out during this interrogation, and she might have essentially trapped herself in the corner with it. She mentioned the fact that she took anxiety medications the previous night. This is coupled with the fact that she could not seem to recall the name of the meds, which is also very strange on its own part. Now, for the next line of questioning. You haven't taken anything while you were at school? No. Okay. Um, now, one thing I would tell you is, um, you know, uh, for your employment, I want you to, you to be truthful. Uh, okay. And so, um, would you uh, be willing to take a breathalyzer test? She willingly accepted to take the breath test, but before taking it, Sergeant Guidon asks another question. Have you taken any sort of medication today? I'm sorry, what? Have you taken any medication today? I did take some medication this morning for my anxiety. What did you take this morning? Um, I think it's called... Um, Um, in the space of one minute, there is already so much discrepancy in her statements. A minute ago, she had taken her anxiety meds the previous night. Now she took them this morning. To explicitly confirm if she took the meds in school, the sergeant asks the following. Did I get here at school? I took it, the, yeah, I took it this morning. While you were here? Yeah, right before I came in, yes. Okay. Is it a prescription? Because you changed your story a little bit. Now yeah, you, you said, said you it was last night. Yeah. Well, I took one last night, and then I took one this morning because my anxiety was really like. After noticing several inconsistencies in her story, things were not looking up for Kimberly Coates, but she still had a chance to beat the allegations. All she had to do was blow double zeros on the breathalyzer. Are you going to blow double zeros? I don't know. You should know. If you hadn't drank anything, you should blow zeros. If you drank something recently, you're, it's going to show it. With the breathalyzer getting unwrapped, Coates was visibly fidgeting and trembling. She told the officer she had never done it before, and also asked what would happen to her if the results were not in her favor. All right, so you're, you're going to blow into it like you're blowing up a balloon, okay? And you're going to keep blowing until I tell you to stop. Until I tell you to stay. Until I tell you to stop, okay? All right. All right, give it a second. I, I don't know how to do this. You're just going to blow into it like you're blowing up a balloon as soon as I tell you to. All right, you ready? Take a big deep breath. 
After seeing the results, Sergeant Gidon had all the evidence he needed. He had obtained objective proof of Kimberly Coates being intoxicated in her third grade classroom. The first thing he did was to show the results of the breathalyzer to his fellow interrogators. The next thing he did was to probe deeper and question Coates again on when last she had a drink. She apparently blew 0.24 on the breathalyzer, which was staggeringly way above the legal limit of 0.08. Coates was then asked if she left campus that day and whether there would be any traces of consumed alcohol in her classroom. She said she hadn't left the school, but strangely did not answer the latter question. She continually denied she had consumed alcohol at school, but after enough pressure, she eventually admitted she had drunk half a box of wine until 3 a.m. earlier that morning. I did drink a lot last night. How much did you drink? I don't... too much. What, what do you drink? Wine. So wine. How, many, how many bottles of wine did you drink? Uh, we had the box. You drink a whole box of wine? Half a box. The officer asked Coates if she drank often, at which point she responded, unfortunately, yes, and that she was as seeing a counselor about it. While Coates continued to maintain that the last time she drank was 3 a.m., Ogle asked whether, in the officer's expert opinion, she was under the influence. Sergeant Geden responded, saying, in my honest opinion, I think she's probably a functioning alcoholic. He then checked her eyes by asking her to focus on a pen as he moved it from side to side. The officer concluded that she was indeed intoxicated. You drank recently. At this point, the superintendent told Coates that she needed to have someone come and pick her up and take her home. She refused to let him call her husband for some reason, and the only alternative to that was getting cuffed and arrested by Sergeant Gaydon. The officer told her he didn't want to have to humiliate her by making the arrest. After a lot of back and forth, she was eventually arrested for suspected intoxication. The entire situation was incredibly sad to watch, depicting a rock-bottom moment for someone struggling with alcohol and depression. She was released from the Payne County Jail in Stillwater, Oklahoma, on a personal recognizance bond on the day after her arrest. She could be given a jail term of 5 to 30 days and a fine of $10 to $100 if convicted of public intoxication. Jennifer Davis. While we're still in the state of Oklahoma, take a seat in the cop car and drive down for our next suspect. Just 50 miles south of Perkins Tryon Intermediate School, where Kimberly Coates was caught, is Jennifer Davis of the Cross Timbers Elementary School. The school of about 450 students in grades 3 through 5 is located in Tecumseh, which is about 40 miles southeast of Oklahoma City. On the 7th of September, at around 8.45 a.m., Oklahoma school staff contacted and informed police because they suspected one of their teachers was drunk. Teacher Jennifer Davis Davis reportedly appeared intoxicated while in her Cross Timbers Elementary School classroom that morning. This early morning call to the police was corroborated by the Tecumseh Police Chief, J.R. Kidney. He stated via the news that, We received a call yesterday morning from the school superintendent, letting us know that he felt like he may have a teacher that was in the classroom who could be under the influence of alcohol. If you're thinking what are the odds that within a span of a month, two Oklahoma State teachers were intoxicated in the classroom, you're not alone. Certain Oklahoma State citizens took to Twitter to also ask what the the problem is. This tweet was directed at Ryan Walters, the Oklahoma State Superintendent of Public Instruction, and said, when will Ryan Walters do something about this epidemic? Another tweet also took a dig at Ryan Walters, which said, wait, is this another drunk school teacher in Ryan Walters, Oklahoma? Immediately after the incident, the school district immediately released a press release, which said Davis was immediately removed from the classroom once she was suspected of being under the influence of alcohol. The school district further described the incident to be disturbing and unsettling. They also mentioned that they had no idea who first learned that Jennifer Davis was intoxicated when she came to school that day. They also couldn't confirm if a student witnessed the teacher's alleged drunkenness. After she was ejected from the classroom, she was taken to where she would be questioned and objectively assessed for intoxication. Live body cam footage of the meeting between law enforcement officers, the district superintendent, and Davis was obtained. Let's hope her story is not as inconsistent as her fellow Oklahoma teacher, Kimberly Coates. So what's going on today? They said they had reports where I was drinking at school, which has never happened. When was the last time you had anything here? Uh, last night. Okay. About what time did you quit drinking? 
uh, probably about 10.30. She stated that she had just a glass of wine the night before, and the officer refused to probe deeper. He decided it was time to perform field sobriety tests on her. If you've seen any movie ever, you would remember seeing cops telling suspected drunk drivers to come out of their cars to perform certain coordination activities. These tests are used by police to determine if a driver is impaired. The tasks assess balance, coordination, and the ability of the driver to divide his attention to more than one task during the field sobriety test. There are three reliable field sobriety tests. They include the walk and turn test, the one leg stand test, and the one that would be performed here as well as in the previous suspect, horizontal gaze nystagmus test or HGN test. All right, what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna check you for HGN. Okay, this is what we call standardized field sobriety tests. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, there's three of them. I'm going to pretty much focus on the first one, which is horizontal gaze and static. So I'm going to have you take your glasses off and I'm going to have you a little stab up when we do this. I'm gonna have you track I am so blind without them, I can't hardly. After briefing her on the sort of test they wanted to do, he further asked if she had any past history of head trauma, as this could affect the test. She said no, and the test commenced. It was time for her moment of truth. After the sobriety test, she was given a breathalyzer to check for her alcohol content. Her alcohol content was reported to be 0.066, which was just slightly under the driving legal limit of 0.08. Now you might be thinking, because she's under the legal limit, she's going to be released without any charges. You would be wrong. She also assumed she'd be let go because she was under the legal limit. Here's the superintendent swiftly dismissing her assumptions. But I'm under the legal limit, right? So, under the legal limit, just means that you're under the legal limit. It shows that there's alcohol in your system, so you are still technically intoxicated. You're just under the legal limit of 0.08. While still trying to plead her case, she requested to know who made the call to the officials, probably a disgruntled fellow staff. I would just like to know who reported. Like, and I did not drink today. Well, That's I'm going to tell I you mean. from a legal standpoint, when people call in and report a crime, of any crime, we're not in the business of telling people who made the report. I, I know reasons behind that. I okay. understand that. Okay. Her actions and their implications for her future with the school were also discussed. In terms of your employment here, Jennifer, we, we can't move forward with you being a teacher here any longer. Okay. If you want to resign, um, that's your option. Um, if you choose not to, though, I would be forced to go to the board and ask for your termination based on the outcome of today. She resigned right there and then, which was quite commendable. You couldn't have asked for someone to accept consequences any better than she did. The school district also stated in that press release that they had a substitute teacher in the classroom and have already begun working on finding a long-term substitute teacher to assist while they search for a permanent teacher. We are committed to finding a great teacher to lead the classroom and help our children excel this year, the school district said. As for Jennifer Davis, she remained coherent, cooperative, and polite right up to the point she was taken out of the office. The conclusion of the interrogation, sobriety test and breathalyzer was that she was under the influence and ultimately she was arrested for a misdemeanor charge of public intoxication and transported to the Potawatomi County Safety Center where she was processed. Lisa Edelstein Looks like we're finally out of Oklahoma State. Our next entry comes from a state that is notorious for misdemeanors and petty crimes. We're talking about the Sunshine State, Florida, with mind-bogglingly strange headlines such as Florida man impersonating a police officer pulls over real cops, or Florida man arrested for crashing car into a mall says he was trying to time travel. Hearing about a teacher getting drunk in school is on the lighter end of the Florida crime spectrum. What might seem like a trivial arrest to the Florida officers must have been quite a traumatic experience for 55-year-old elementary school teacher Lisa Edelstein. This Florida teacher from Pinellas County was accused of showing up intoxicated in school. She had only been working at the Skyview Elementary School for about a week before she decided to show up absolutely plastered. The school called police officers when Edelstein was seen yelling in front of kids and acting drunk. Very strange thing to do after just being employed for seven days, coupled with the fact that her own child was a third grader at the same elementary school. Mother of seven, Brandy Parker, was called by the school district after the whole fiasco. And this was what she had to say. When you make that decision in the line of work that you are in um yeah that's an automatic like fired re not hire some people don't have backgrounds and they take a wrong turn in life and it catches up to them so do i blame the school absolutely not 
According to the arrest affidavit, the terms used to describe Edelstein's behavior in front of the children in her class were boisterous and belligerent. After noticing this behavior, campus police quickly contacted Pinellas Park Police Department, where Sergeant Roxanne Pohl was dispatched to the location. On getting there, Sergeant Pohl stated that Edelstein was seen rocking back and forth, stumbling all over the place with bloodshot, watery eyes and slurring her speech. Bloodshot, watery eyes, slurring of the words, there was some rocking back and forth. Uh, you know, stumbling. When speaking with the suspect, the officers could smell alcohol in her breath. They also warned her and demanded that she lower her voice, as they were still on the school premises with children trying to go on with their day. The 55-year-old was noticed constantly swaying while quickly trying to get in her car. I did ask her to lower her voice. I attempted to explain that there were students in the school that uh, did not, we wished they not be interrupted. The officer admitted her disappointment about the whole ordeal, insisting that teachers like her should serve as role models to the children, not as cautionary tales. I was shocked, disappointed. Uh, again, a trust here is someone who we expect to come to school ready to teach. And unfortunately, that's not what happened this morning. Now, this was not her first tango with the law. Edelstein had faced disciplinary action during part of her 30 years as an assistant teacher in Hillsborough County. Today, she faces a disorderly conduct charge and possibly more. She could be charged with illegal possession of marijuana as it was found in her car. At around 9 a.m. that day, she was arrested and taken to the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office. What was found in her car? Uh, marijuana. The school district immediately put out a statement, notifying all parents and parties concerned. Miss Edelstein was recently hired as an itinerant teacher by Pinellas County Schools and was on a probationary contract. School staff noticed Miss Edelstein exhibiting unusual behavior prior to the start of the school day. She was immediately moved to a private area, and the school's police department was called for assistance. Miss Edelstein was ultimately charged with disorderly conduct, and her employment contract was terminated. Ollie Joel. Looks like it's two for two today, with the first two entries being from the state of Oklahoma. It's only fitting for the last two entries to hail from the state of Florida, about 120 miles northeast of Lisa Edelstein's Pinellas County. Meet Holly Joel, a 52-year-old second grade school teacher at the Bentley Elementary School in Sanford, Florida. Now, she wasn't even a permanent teacher at the elementary school. She was a substitute teacher. School board officials mentioned that Holly Joel had been a substitute with the district since 2014 and somehow miraculously passed a background check when her record was anything but clean. It was later discovered in 2012 that she had been arrested for driving under the influence. The school board was probed by the reporters about how she could be hired with a charge like that. If the driving under the influence charge had picked up on a thorough background, check, perhaps the school could have avoided today's fiasco entirely. On that fateful Tuesday morning, Holly Joel was teaching the second grade classroom while appearing visibly intoxicated. A fellow teacher noticed her strange antics and decided to call the principal. By the time the principal of Bentley Elementary School confronted Holly Joel, the substitute teacher was already behaving suspiciously. He immediately called the school resource officer, and this was when things went from suspicious to wacky. When the school resource officer went to the classroom to investigate, he told Holly Joel to stand up from the desk, and when she did, she fell into the window. The officer also noted in his reports that Joel smelled of alcohol and was slurring her words. It must have been quite an unpleasant sight for the second graders to see. Some of the parents of these children had a lot to say about the incident. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah, that's scary. That's definitely scary with the kids in the classroom. I'm in shock right now. And, you know, with, with all due respect, you know, I just hope that, you know, the courts prevail and they do whatever they got to do to to make things go the way it's supposed to go. After she was escorted out of the classroom, she was taken to where she'd be interrogated. But firstly, they wanted to make sure she was 100% intoxicated. So they did what any decent teacher would do, administer a test, a test which she would fail spectacularly. According to the reports, the interrogation started off simple, with Holly Joel being asked what day it was. She couldn't tell the interrogators what day it was, believing it was Monday when it was actually Tuesday. The next question was to name the president, to which she answered Obama, which was correct at the time. She was further asked asked for the president's first name, and she repeated herself, saying, Obama. This was very clearly not the right answer, as his first name was Barack. According to the arrest affidavit, throughout the test, Holly Joel's head was rocking back and forth as she struggled hopelessly to keep her eyes open. In her defense, Holly Joel stated that she was simply tired. I wonder what level of tiredness could make someone stumble into a window, forget what day it is, and forget the first name of the most popular man on earth at the time. Other key facts that came up on the arrest. Affidavit
affidavit were that Joel reportedly had a water bottle in the classroom filled with a pink liquid that smelled of alcohol, as well as a couple of prescription pills in her purse. After failing her test, Holly Joel was driven by a police officer to Central Florida Regional Hospital, where she received a medical check. Her next destination was an all-expense-paid trip to the Seminole County Jail, where she was charged with disorderly intoxication, child neglect, and disturbing the peace. A spokesman for the Seminole County School Board, Michael Lawrence, cited that fewer than 25 children were in the classroom during the incident, as well as an intern. Lawrence also made it known that Holly Joel did not have a teaching certificate and she was not employed as a long-term substitute. He added that Joel was scheduled to substitute 10 times that year, but she did not work for the district during the previous year's school calendar. He firmly stated she would never be invited back. A letter was sent to the student's home, which noted that Joel was behaving oddly and may have been under the influence of a prohibited substance. At no time were the students in danger or unsupervised, the letter said. The letter was supposed to calm the nerves and fears of parents, but some still took the matter up. For them to witness it in a, supposed to be a, you know, a, a pristine environment, you know, away from drugs and alcohol, because that's not the message we're trying to get across to our children. Holly Joel had an $8,500 bond, which she was able to post before having to go in front of a judge. If you enjoyed this video, check out our other awesome videos about crime and prison on the channel. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.